Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to NDEC Engage. I'm Beth Smiley, and I'm the Communications Director for NDEC. We're very excited to have you all joining us today for this online conference event. A couple of instructions for Zoom. I'll just hand that over to take a quick look. In terms of accessibility for a webinar, this is best viewed on a desktop or laptop rather than a phone. Make sure your sound is on if you'd like access to the voice interpretation. You can turn on captioning at the bottom to see the captioning services. And if you have technical difficulties of any sound, of, of any description, please chat that to tech support. Let's do a quick refresher on how to use Zoom. The Zoom software has actually had a fairly recent update, so hopefully you're using the latest version. It's best viewed in full screen, and you can pick between watching the video and the opt and the uh, shared PowerPoint and, use, and making them different sizes by putting your cursor over the line between the two and adjusting accordingly. And again, if you have any questions as we go through this, use the Q&A uh, option at the bottom of your screen. For technical questions, please use chat. For questions related to the content, please use the Q&A. We'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors now. CSD Learns, NAD, Gallaudet University, Indiana School for the Deaf, the American School for the Deaf, and Dawn Sign Press. Thank you very much. This event would not have happened without their support. At this point, I'd like to introduce Howard Rosenblum. He is the CEO of the National Association for the Deaf, and he has some opening remarks. Howard, over to you. Hello, thank you, Beth. First of all, I think we should congratulate NDEC for hosting this fabulous event. It was supposed to be in Chicago, but things have shifted pretty quickly this year. So the uh, opportunity to make it virtual and get it done as smoothly as they have should be recognized to the NDEC committee. That said, how did NDEC even begin? Patrick Graham and Tawny Holmes Lightbock approached uh, myself and Christopher Wagner, who was then NAD president. And they said to us, we need a conference specifically for teachers of the deaf. There isn't anything else out there and we need to make this opportunity available. Well, that suggestion had our full support. We were fully in agreement with the concept and it's been remarkable starting in 2016 in Phoenix and being an annual event thereafter with people congregating to learn, share best practices, give information, research, and really do a remarkable job. So Patrick and Tawny, I would like to thank for their efforts in getting this off the ground. And since that time, the team has expanded into various areas of development and learning how to make this happen. We're currently under the tutelage of Chris Majeri, who has taken on the responsibility for this. So our thanks to Chris and his team. And in NAD's 140 year history, this is the first virtual event like this. And 140 years sounds like a, a, a really long time and yet we have screeched to a different place here in the year 2020. I don't think any of us have ever experienced anything like what we've seen this year, with the implications of COVID-19 and its spread and how it's impacted education. There are challenges with how to teach any child, but in particular deaf children in this environment, looking at the uses of technology and the myriad challenges that exist there with various platforms and bandwidth, how to teach in this virtual medium, and then looking at 
families that may not have the resources necessary for this new virtual educational environment. We're also looking at a resurgence of Black Lives Matter, the death of George Floyd, and again, many other horrendous incidents that have really been uh, exposing the systemic racism that exists in society that we need to work against. We are overdue for changes at the systemic level in that regard. And at NAD, we're aware of some of those challenges that also include health and systemic oppression in healthcare, where deaf people are concerned, where black, indigenous and people of colour are concerned as marginalised communities and looking at the access they have to technology, considering uh, poverty, considering lack of access to appropriate education. All of those elements absolutely need to change. The analogy I draw is to sports. So if we look at, well, not that any sports teams are currently operating, but in their regular environment, if the team's not working, they give it some thought. Perhaps they were champions for several years in a row and then hit a bad spot. They sit down and reconsider. I think that's a good analogy for what NAD is doing. Taking that time to reconsider, to look at changes. So a team may look at changing the coach, changing out the players, putting them into different positions, looking at rebuilding. And I see that as a parallel for the year 2020, as I said, for what we could rebuild for we, an opportunity for us to learn how to redesign education to be more effective for deaf children, to make healthcare more equitable, to make sure that the uh, issues that have currently existed within the education system are issues that we look at and remediate during this time. We need to make sure that education takes out the idea of white supremacy, untangles itself from that at a systematic level so that all children are truly, fairly and equitably educated. When we look back at all the contributions that are made by people of a variety of cultures and backgrounds, we need to uh, ensure that that is put into place as we go from here on out, taking this as that opportunity to rebuild. So as we look here for the year 2020 and forwards, we want to make it better for all deaf children to ensure that they are getting the education they need for their education and to reach their potential and follow their dreams. So thank you all very much. I wish you all a very successful event. Beth Smiley. Thank you, Howard. Goodness, 140 years. It's amazing. I would like at this point to introduce Raja Kushalnegar. Raja is the Director of the Information Technology Program in the Department of Science, Technology and Mathematics at Gallaudet University in Washington, DC. Raja's research interests encompass the fields of accessible commuting, computing and accessibility intellectual property law with the goal of improving information access for people with sensory disabilities. In today's presentation, he is going to discuss educational accessibility for information and communication where deaf and hard of hearing students are concerned and look at how accessible technology can provide functional equivalence through guidelines, applications and services. And he will also include some demonstrations and examples of information and communication accessibility. Today's topic is deaf eyes in education. And Raja, over to you. Thank you so much for the invitation to be with you here today. So deaf eyes in education really means that I'm going to be sharing with you the best ways to communicate for deaf individuals to best ways to have accessible information shared with your deaf and hard of hearing students.
what I'm going to do is actually give you time to read each slide. So don't worry about that. I will actually not be presenting over my slides. I'll make sure everybody has a moment to look at the slides and then I'll present on the slides. So this slide says deaf hard of hearing demographics or DHH. As most of you know that this is a low incidence population comprising about 2% who are hard of hearing and only 0.5% who are deaf. Uh, a few, uh, a much smaller percentage of deaf individuals end up going to university. And of course, they are distributed throughout the country. So we cannot imagine that mainstream society understands the needs of access for all deaf individuals. Designers are not aware of individual needs and therefore do not design for them. Next slide, please. I do want to say we've made great strides. As recently as the 1960s, there were only seven institutions of higher learning that accepted deaf students. And the rest of the institutions just didn't. They just did not accept deaf or hard of hearing applicants. And so once you graduated from high school, you had to go into a vocation, most likely. Now we see at the year 2020, three quarters of the institutions are enrolling deaf students, are open to deaf students. But of course, there is work to do. The graduation rate for hearing students is 50% but deaf students is 25%. We have a huge attrition problem. And of course, there are many factors for this, such as access, language deprivation, information access, communication access, which is what we're talking about today. And I'm actually just gonna be talking about communication access and information access. Those are the, the topics for today. We don't have quite enough time to go through all of the factors that affect the attrition rate amongst deaf and hard of hearing students. There are many, many barriers we could consider. And of course, we would like to see at least some of these barriers mitigated so that we can reach a, a parity of a graduation rate such as their hearing peers. Next slide, please. So I did just share some of these factors. This is just a, another um, demonstration of it. We see that we only have 25% of deaf students are graduating. There are inadequate access to materials. Um, there are delays in terms of service provision. There be, may be missed content due to multiple visual sources. In other words, if a student is looking at the teacher and then looking at the slide and then looking at the interpreter, there's a chance for missed content. There are obviously a lack of classroom participation. It's a complicated issue, um, but I'm just going to focus again on the access to information and communication. Next slide, please. So of course, as you all know, hearing students have the access of two channels to receive information, the auditory and the visual channel. And deaf students have to switch between visual information and visual accommodation. They only have the one channel that they are using to access information. If everybody in the room is using sign language, then turn taking is done in a more deliberate way, which allows for that visual channel to be fully maximized. But if there's information presented in a multiple of channels, a multiplicity of channels, and you have only one channel to receive it, there is a chance of missed content. So there is a tool in research settings that is known as eye tracking. You'll see it on this slide and some of the other slides as well, where we can actually see via the technology where somebody's eyes are, where they are gazing. And then we can see what sort of information they have access to based on their eye gaze. 
one of the results of having um, one modality open to you is that you are going to prioritize where you are putting your eye gaze. You don't have access to the auditory channel. You're spending a lot of time, let's say, looking at the interpreter or reading the captions, which is shortchanging your ability to look at the slides. And as we have seen from the research we've done, there's about 90% of the time the eye gaze is concentrated on the interpreter, which means that that student is not taking in the, the other information presented in the classroom, whether that be on the slide or from the teacher or from classmates. So they have to prioritize one source of information over the other. We can imagine a math classroom where you have to take time to digest the content but you may not have enough time if, if you're switching between the visual sources of information. So that's where we want to mitigate some of those missed content opportunities. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later about how technology may ameliorate that situation. Next slide, please. Obviously, the goal is parity with hearing peers. Using either new technology, such as an avatar, or being in a deaf classroom where everybody is operating according to the same norms, we may be able to achieve more of an equal amount of information being received. Next slide, please. So vision is quite different than hearing. Um, those of you who are hearing know that you can hear sounds from a 360 degree all over you, behind you, in front of you, on either side. Of course, the eyes don't work in quite the same way. The eyes can only see basically straight ahead with a little bit of an angle to the sides as peripheral vision. And we only have a field of view of about 10 degrees without moving the head, and then of course, that it's quite fatiguing if you are moving your head and moving your eyes to enable you to see what is happening. So we want to minimize the fatigue that deaf and hard of hearing students are experiencing by presenting the information in the most readily accessible way. So we have the 10 degrees of a field of view, we understand that. We know that when there are interpreters present in the classroom, the best obviously would be if the interpreter is close enough to the presenter and the materials being presented on the slide that all can be seen within that 10 degree field of view. But you have to remember in a hearing classroom, there are parallel sources of information. And because of less distractions, we may, we may be able to achieve more information being received. We all know that in the beginning of film, all movies were silent. They were silent movies. They didn't have subtitles or captioning as we know it. They had something known as intertitles, where you would literally have this interruption of the scene by uh, written information being shared. And would go back and forth. So it would be the actors, and then it would be the intertitles. You can go to the next slide. <clears throat> 
in the early days of film, 1900 to 1920s, all movies were silent. They had not yet come up with the technology for talking pictures or talkies. And so information was presented completely visually for both audiences, hearing and deaf audiences. And like I explained earlier, they, the intertitles uh, would be shown between the scenes with the actors, which meant that there were no barriers. Hearing and deaf audiences alike had the equivalent experience watching the actors reading the intertitles. And news or other kinds of entertainment would be presented in the same way. And so there were no barriers at that time. And then in the late 20s, they developed the technology for movies to become talking pictures. And by the 30s, all movies were talking pictures, which was the first time then that deaf and hard of hearing audiences were presented with this barrier. And Emil Ladner, you see the quote on the slide, who graduated from Gallaudet, who had wrote a beautiful essay um, in the American Annals of the Deaf and won a competition for it, speaks about how sad it was. In fact, he used the word uses the word calamity to the deaf. The disappearance of the silent films has been a calamity to the deaf and dreamed of an invention that would throw the words spoken directly under the screen. Of course, we know that today is captioning, but in the 1930s, that was not a technology that uh, was understood or used or invented. It wasn't until the 1990s that captioning really became something more expected on TV and movies and so forth. And of course, the reason for that is that deaf people were not involved in the associations in the 30s, developing the technologies, pushing for the technologies to be used. And so, of course, those ideas might not have been shared with the relevant or appropriate parties who could make it happen. So when deaf people have gotten involved in technology and pushing for technology innovation, then we see changes. But here's an example where deaf people had to wait a very long time to enjoy movies yet again. Next slide, please. So the, this slide speaks to the different ways that the different communities receive information. So somebody who is hard of hearing may have some residual hearing. They may be speech reading. They may also be using signs. They may have assistive listening devices. Now, when we look at somebody who is uh, deaf and their main modality is gonna be the visual channel, then they can access information either through signs or through captions or future innovations yet to be uh, envisioned. And for production, in both cases, deaf and hard of hearing both, some people may choose to speak. Uh, some people, I mean, remember, people use communication such as writing back and forth or nowadays using their phone to text. So there are different ways that deaf and hard of hearing individuals express themselves to communicate with other individuals who don't share the same language. Next slide, please. I mentioned this earlier, and of course, we know that there is a continuum from deaf and hard of hearing individuals, and also even within a similar um, decibel loss, we have total diversity of needs. So there is no one size fits all approach that will work. Uh, unfortunately, many hearing people think they can put in one accommodation and all of the needs will be met, but it's not true. And even if we have a technological innovation, it's going to have to be customizable to each user, whether it's AI or some other presentation, and it's a different presentation, but whatever the technology uh, is that is going to be used, we need to be cognizant of the fact that it has to be customizable for each individual. Next slide, please. 
we did a survey of deaf individuals about how they will communicate with hearing people. And we asked them, how do you express yourselves? And of course, there was the range, as we saw on an earlier slide, in terms of techniques that were used. Some individuals never you know, use speech. Some do all the time, and some sometimes do, and sometimes don't. So the question was, how well are they understood by others? And you can see here on the slide that it varies. So again, communication access varies, and how we design to serve individuals is going to vary. Next slide, please. Next slide. We asked, uh, the first slide, the previous slide was, um, how well are you understood? This slide we asked, how will you communicate with hearing coworkers on the job? And what sorts of techniques will you use or methodologies? And again, there's a multiplicity of, of methodologies and approaches. Some would speak for themselves, some will use some sort of writing, whether it's email or texting, some will gesture. It's really all over the map in terms of how people will attempt to be understood and communicate with their hearing coworkers. We asked them about concerns that they might have about communicating at work, acknowledging that no communication methodology is perfect. Um, and there were some concerns that were about being understood accurately and some concerns about um, their level of language or the understanding that they may be able to convey. We're not here to necessarily talk about those issues, but again, when we talk about artificial intelligence or, or avatars, we may have technology that might ameliorate some of those concerns, perhaps translating the language in a different way. Um, it's, another, it's another issue for another presentation, but I do wanna talk again about the information accessibility and communication accessibility. So there are fears or concerns about confidence, about being misunderstood, and the confidence has to do with both the language and the content that they're sharing. Next slide, please. So communication and information accessibility, all other things being equal, will be maximized when, um, when technology can be brought to bear to support that information. And the key is that we're maximized uh, the audiovisual presentation. Everything is consciously planned and thought out for in order to enhance accessibility of information. Next slide, please. I wanna talk about an optimal communication event where either everybody is deaf using sign language or everybody, I should say, all are using a visual modality or all are using an auditory modality. So imagine that everybody's hearing, they're using the auditory channel. Um, they have access to the slides as well. They have access to the visual modality. Or if everybody's operating under visual norms, so they're seated, for example, in the half circle, um, an all deaf classroom, for example, where uh, it is clear whose turn it is and everybody orients to that person and they uh, raise their hand to be recognized and wait until they've been recognized until everybody then is looking at them so that there is no loss of information. Like I said back in the time of silent movies, visual communication 
was how the movies were presented. So for both hearing and deaf individuals, they were able to enjoy the movies with those intertitles. But now we're talking about the blended communication event where it becomes difficult for our deaf and hard of hearing students to fully maximize the information. So now we've added an accommodation such as a captionist or an interpreter. That's what you see in the middle of this slide the blended classroom. We've got a hearing professor, we've got the interpreter, we've got the captions, and we have all of the students. And you can see that the, the emphasis here is really not on solely visual communication. It's a blended situation and it leads to difficulties for our students. Next slide, please. So many classrooms nowadays um, have many visual sources of information that are running simultaneously. So there's the teacher, there's the interpreter, they may have their own laptop for notes, and there, there are the slides or the PowerPoint deck. There may be um, a personal note taker for deaf students, which will minimize um, their distraction. They can at least uh, eliminate one of the sources of, of visual distraction for themselves, but they still have a lot of things to look at. And there isn't really time for students to digest the content when they are having to use so many different sources of visual information. So what we see on the left side of this slide is the information that is intending to be shared. You can see with the, the blue bar, by the time we get all the way to the right side of the slide, that information um, is greatly diminished. And that's because of all of the barriers along the way for the student who is attempting to receive that information through less than ideal means. And so there is information and communication loss. And we would like to see the use of technology ameliorate some of those difficulties or mitigate some of the loss that, of, of the information that is lost. Next slide, please. What you might have noticed in the vignette we just saw is this simulation of what it looks like for a deaf student to be in a mainstream class and the demands on their visual attention. They want to look at the content itself as it's being written out. They want to watch the interpreter for the content and they also want to be looking at the professor and it's impossible to catch all of that. So when a hearing student is there, that the equivalent that we've just shown for you is taking off the audio when the student looks at the content so that you can see what information you do and don't get as a deaf student in a mainstream class. So the point I'm looking at here is how can we look at what the ideal scenario is for deaf students and then use some of those ideas to uh, mitigate the issues that arise in mainstream classrooms. You can have things like personal note takers, uh, interpreting services. We want to make sure that these best practices mitigate information loss and instead come closer to remedying the inequalities currently in existence. That also reduces stress and reduces loss of information. So if 
we can better target all of this, we get to a more effective success rate and a higher rate of graduation for deaf and hard of hearing students, which is one of the primary goals here. Now, before we dive further into the deaf side of this, I want to look at the hard of hearing experience for a moment. Hard of hearing people may experience misunderstandings in words as they are pronounced. And words may have a couple of different meanings and therefore a couple of different uh, misunderstandings are possible. So let's take a look at this. If you could click on the slide, yes. This is the story of Little Red Riding Hood. And the story unfolds the way you might be familiar with, but with some common misunderstandings in how the words are pronounced or how the words are, are heard, and therefore the impact on the brain's understanding of the content. So this is what some hard of hearing people deal with on a daily basis. So let's take a quick look. So it starts with once upon a time, but you can see that it's written as once porn term. They sound very similar, but they can be misunderstood because they sound so similar. And that confusion can then result. So the professor of French took this on as a project to see what English words would look like when misunderstood this way and showed them in these two different ways. And again, this, is, this may be a struggle with accent as well. That is something else that hard of hearing people may be listening to and therefore not fully understanding. And again, with AI, we can potentially simplify this process or turn it into captions that can just be read, which would, might be a more accurate way of looking at it. Okay, that's the, deaf, that's the hard of hearing experience. Let's look now at some uh, issues particular to access for deaf students. In this example, we've again looked at eye tracking, and that's the colored line you can see in each of the videos, describing what kind of student is looking at what kind of content. So the hearing student is looking at the uh, presenter and at the slides the whole time. And as we saw a few slides ago, the difference for deaf students is that they are looking mainly at the interpreter. So 90% of the time, is spent by deaf students looking at the interpreter for information and not at the audiovisual slides that are supporting the information. For hearing students, they're looking at the slides for 70% of the time. So in that 70% of time that a hearing student's looking, they do have enough time to digest the information, to contemplate it, to understand what's being said and to make connections to the information on the screen. In contrast, the deaf student does not have that time. They have perhaps 10% of their attention focused on the slides and the rest of it on the interpreter. So they, they're not having the same experience with the content. They're not having the same experience with the ability to digest it in class and make applications. So that's obviously an impact of concern. That's something that needs to be addressed. So instead, if teachers give all students time to look at the slides before they're being discussed, similarly to the manner in which I'm presenting my content today, looking at the slides and then looking at the content, which is how it would be uh, typically in a deaf only or a signing only classroom, that's one possible accommodation that would benefit students in a mainstream setting. Another, another uh, assistant or assisting device would be pointing at the slides to bring people's gaze into particular points of the slide that you're looking to accentuate. That's also a way to help deaf students concentrate on the information at hand. And we used eye tracking, again, to see where students' eyes were looking between the interpreter and the content. Again, that is a possible way to help mitigate some of the issues in mainstream settings for deaf students.
So the visual field works quite differently to the oral field. So as we look at the uh, attenuation, we know that increased distance means less decibel level. So the volume decreases at distance. But in sign language, it works differently. So instead, for the processes of this, uh, for the purposes of this testing, we looked at it a little differently to see what the oral connection is to the visual channel. Sorry, if you'd stay on that slide. And looking, looking at what happens with speech and what happens with captions and signs with distance. Deaf people have what's called deaf gain, where distance is concerned because they can still see full information presented in sign language. So that's a gain that people who are hearing don't have where volume is concerned. The difference, however, is in body positionality. So if you turn away, then the signs might not be as visible. So if we're looking at oral information coming into the ear, versus information coming in that is read by the eyes, they operate quite differently. So you can catch the words as they come across the screen, the way they come into your eyes, but it comes in differently to how you might be signing communication. Words come in a linear fashion in text, come, but come in in a comprehensive three-dimensional version in a signed language. So that has an impact on learning process, which we'll get to in this next slide. The next slide, if you would. And one more. What we have in this slide is looking at the eye gaze of a student watching the content. So you see a red dot showing where the student is looking at that at any particular time. And you can see where the, when the dot moves, it means the student's eye gaze is changing. Let's take a look. So you'll notice when the person is signing, the eye gaze is approximately on their face and upper body. But you'll notice that the eye gaze changes across the other side of the screen where they're watching the handwriting content. This is in a sense how it works with captioning. So let's add that to the mix. And press play. If you press play. So you'll notice again that the eye gaze is changing, but in a different way to the pattern of eye gaze as it changes between a signed content and a written content. This time when we're looking at captioning, the eyes work differently. They will look word by word. So it's uh, not a fluent reader and it's someone who might be a little bit on overload here. And deaf students sometimes find this when reading captions because it's a stressful enterprise. It's tiring cognitively and on the eyes. So deaf students who are avid readers read differently to when they do that with captions. But captions come in, as I said, more stressfully than a signed language does. So the two approaches are quite different in the impact on the student. Sign language is much more about communication and captions are much more about conveying information. And it's uh, usually much more literal in captioning but it does not capture the emotion or intonation of the delivery. So there are pros and cons to both sides, but I just do want you to understand that they are quite different in terms of the efficiency and effectiveness of how they are input to the deaf learner. 
sign language may often be easier to follow when looking between a signer and a visual aids than looking at captions to visual aids. In a deaf class, you'll typically see information written on the board and instructions that can be captured by the students. Then when you're looking at uh, captioning services or interpreting services, there's always that delay that is inherent in the process. So that means deaf students run the risk of missing information at any of those transition points. So you might want to repeat the information and have it on the board as well as conveyed to the students so they're no longer concerned with uh, missing information if it's static and represented on the board. And they're no longer worried about where to look for the information, the presenter, the interpreter, the board. Instead, just have it all on the board and it's much less cognitively exhausting for the deaf student. It makes it easier for them to capture the information and make the requisite notes that are needed. So there's a little research going on around that and uh, looking for some additional funding. So let's move away from that visual distraction for a mo moment and look instead at visual noise. And you might wonder what visual noise is. Well, let's take a look at that. It may be a room that's not very, not very well lit and the lights get turned off when there's a video in the class, which means the interpreter is not well lit and that becomes a struggle. There may be a light behind the interpreter. Or what I often see in computer classes is all those computer monitors in the classroom with an interpreter at one side and a presenter or instructor at the other and a deaf student having to look between the two while looking through all of the computer monitors. There are a couple of examples of visual noise that we can consider uh, removing or at least reducing in the classroom. And if you press play, take a look at this. What you may notice here is the additional visual noise in this setting. There is the distance between various sources of information and the deaf students and the energy that that takes. Not about the audible noise in this, but all of these elements add stress to the student who's reading content close, looking out at the slide, looking to find the teacher, seeing where the captioning art is and where the whiteboard is, etc. We want to make pay some attention to this visual noise and its impact. And to that end, here are some suggestions. You might reserve seating for deaf students with the least visual noise, it's typically in the front seat, but not always. Avoid distractions. Don't block the visuals as you walk around the class. And consider things like not dimming all the lights while watching videos or providing a spotlight for interpreting services so that they are still visible and accessible during those moments in class. Automatic captions are not an automatic solution for accessibility in the classroom. To start with, a lot of media does not have human captions yet. And as you just saw, there were over a million hits for a video vignette here. And yet, very few of them have captions 
automated captions are sometimes there, but as I've said, they're not a solution, which we'll see and we'll see why in the next slide. So speech is produced at different speeds, somewhere between 150 and 300 words per minute. So if we're looking at a line of text, that's somewhere around two and a half to five words per second. So they, each word may be, or each line may be exhibited for somewhere between a half a second to two seconds. And that's not always intelligible to the reader. If you have instead a professional human captioner, we have less of this issue. It's typically a little more simplified, a little more seamless, and they have a little more control over the lines and therefore the number of words per line and how those lines come up. So I'm going to show you an example of what this of automated captioning and you'll see why it's hard to catch as a reader. Now press play. You may have noticed that it was hard to catch all of the captioning because of the short amount of time where each line shows up and the different positioning on the screen. If you are simply listening to this, it's much easier because the uh, audio feed comes in automatically and makes this uh, vignette actually quite fun. But if you're simply reading this via captions, you definitely miss the joke. And this is where human captioning is superior to automated captioning. And again, is a difference between when we look at speech production versus uh, text that's being read. Another thing that's really important to consider in the classroom environment, and also when we're looking at uh, video materials used in the classroom, is what isn't caught is the environmental information, the meta information, what we call non-speech or meta speech information. Things like phone, phone ringings, uh, footsteps, human captioning or subtitling can include those elements in ways that automated captioning does not. So that the viewer gets all of the access to the information going on that's not simply limited to the speech. This is not a solution, we don't have a full solution for this yet, however. Let's take a look at the impact. So you notice the deaf guy has no idea why his friend has just disappeared. But the viewer knows because we recognize that the phone rang. So if you, as a watcher, have access to that audible uh, information that is not speech, that really helps with context, and that can be applied to both the classroom environment and to everyday life. Let's take a look. Oh, next slide. So in the educational environment in particular, when we look at things like the number of lines visible in captioning and having some flexibility with that, looking at line by line versus continuous scroll, all of those can impact the reader's experience. Having the ability to pause, to label, and to uh, emphasize points that have been missed to go back to would all be good additions. And there are visual search cues. We press play. Oh, actually, that one's a still shot, not a video. On to the next slide, if you would. This one is a video. So in this example, we have the sign language interpreter incorporated into the visual content. So they're accessible for everyone in the class. 
and is shown on screen, which is a different approach, but that helps all of the deaf students in the class, regardless of where they're sitting, to be able to see and therefore be engaged in that class. And in this example, we're looking at who is making the comment. So the uh, green exclamation point hovers over the person who's uttering that comment. So you may be familiar with Google Glasses that you can wear in the movie theatre that provide captioning. The same approach might be used in the educational arena. That's also some technology that's under review as we look at how deaf students can fight for better technological access in the classroom. When we look at engineering from a couple of different perspectives, what, it, what comes out is that diversity and inclusion are incredibly important parts of the design of engineering, but they're not always considered. When they are considered, everybody wins. For example, adding captioning to everyday life, when there are noisy environments like a bar or a sports stadium, or you're in a quiet room or something's been presented in foreign language, captioning can help in all of those settings. So it's a great solution for more than just the deaf and hard of hearing population. When we look at the silent movies from 100 years ago, then deaf people lost access for a while, but are getting closer now to equal access by having deaf people involved in the creativity of the technology and the design and the conversation from the get-go. And it's not to say that deaf people should simply be passive users of the end results of this technology, but rather that they should be proactively involved and engaged in the production, conception and design of new technology. If there are not enough deaf people involved in these ideas, then the technology may fade away from isolation. One example of many where this, this can be very fruitful is looking at emergency visual notifications. So I'll ask you to look at this GIF about escape routes and tell me whether you think A or B is clearer as uh, an animation telling you what you should do in case of an emergency. Let's take a quick look. So to practice what we preach, we are running the Summer Institute, Summer Research Institute, and it's been going uh, for several years now and looking, giving students access to technology, working in different uh, industries as interns coming in with us. And now looking at how the program is going to force change, to make things better with deaf people's engagement and involvement to new accessible technology and new ways of using it. And uh, there is going to be a Q&A momentarily, and I'll be happy to take your questions at that time. Thank you so much, Raja. We very much appreciated your presentation. We're gonna take a 10 minute break here before we come back for the Q&A. 
but let me be very clear that the Q&A is only accessible to those who are joining us via Zoom, so just a heads up to our audience members. So go ahead and take a 10 minute break, we'll see you soon. Hello and welcome back. We are going to begin our Q&A session and I'm pleased to see that Raja is back here. We do have many questions that have come in and just as a reminder, we are only able to take questions through the Zoom platform. If you, um, you can click on the Q&A module and somebody else is monitoring those questions. So are you ready, Raja? The first question is, can you tell us a little bit about what piqued your interest in this field? What originally got you interested? Yeah, I certainly think that my prior experience in computer education got me interested in applying it to the educational sphere. Uh, I like to be in the analysis side because analysis leads to understanding, which leads to solutions. So I would say it's a cross between my work in access technology and in computer science, both of them as applied to education. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the question of gaze, eye gaze and technology. If we maximize the use of technology in schools for deaf and hard of hearing students, what might that look like? So yeah, it's about eye contact, certainly. So your eyes, in a sense, mirror the brain. So think about a deaf person. When the intent is to communicate and understand, and all of that is happening through the eyes, you, there are ways to capitalize on that. But we have to look at attention and uh, other ways of using technology in this. So the ability to connect and to support improved communication and learning processes for the deaf person in their given environment. When we look at research, it shows us with evidence that there are ways to improve teaching approaches, first of all, and also including deaf students and deaf and thus including deaf people in the service provision as well. And that uh, collective synthesis can make a big impact. Thank you. What type of skills do you see students coming into college with uh, where teachers and faculty have been fully prepared, or are they? Deaf, deaf students in high school or having come through the K through 12 setting don't seem to be well trained on independence or autonomy. They've been given services by the school, so they've never learned how to request the services or how to articulate them. When they get to college, they can be a little flummoxed. So I'd like to see more of that sense of autonomy or agency for students as they're coming up before they get to college so that they know what services to request and know how to request the services. And all of that can improve their visual comprehension in a classroom. Then when faculty come into the picture, uh, I wish that they would show things by example and that they would look at technology as ways to tailor to particular students. Well, hopefully many of our audience members are teachers and they'll go back to the classroom with some of these techniques in mind. Indeed. Uh, question that you shared with us had to do with some research that was done. Oh, and the audience want to know that was done with mainstream settings, not residential schools for the deaf. What year was, were those surveys distributed? Uh, 2015, and it was mainstream settings. 
Well, the survey was for college students, so not high school students. Do keep that in mind because the summer students who work at, with us at the college and are enga engaged in research with us are where we start from. So we looked at two and four year colleges and uh, that research was, yeah, 2015. Thank you. Um, one of the audience members said that they found your visual distribution explanation very compelling. And they often find themselves preferring to sit in the back of the room uh, to enable them to get more of that visual field of, of view open to them. And yet, in a main, that's in a mainstream classroom. And yet, that seems to contradict with the common best practices in the field where deaf and hard of hearing students are typically encouraged to sit in the front of the classroom. So how might you propose the enhancement of the deaf and hard of hearing students viewing experience in a mainstream setting? Yeah, part of it is the, is the visual field and part of it is visual noise. And we sometimes see a clash happen between the two. So if you're sitting at the front, you may have field of view but you have less visual noise. So perhaps you can see what you're looking at directly, clearly. But if you're sitting at the back, you have a wider field of view and can see more of what's going on in the classroom, but there is perhaps more visual noise. So it's about your priorities, about personal preference, about what that particular classroom setup looks like and what works best for you. There's no one size fits all approach. So people's uh, preferences must be taken into consideration. But if we can help students engage with that thought process about the pros and cons of each of those approaches, sitting close, less, uh, less overall visible access versus sitting further back, then that would be optimal. You know, a related question might be that, you know, student preference requires somebody to advocate for themselves. Sure. But students can sometimes be a little lackadaisical, shall we say. So we also want to make sure that we're talking with students about what's best for them in terms of information access and therefore empowering their sense of agency to do something about it. And I mean, it's, it's critical to get them into an optimum learning environment. It would be nice for students to have some sort of training in self-advocacy so that they can speak up when appropriate. Absolutely agreed. Um, moving on to the next question. How do you gain access to this type of technology and training on how to use it? Yeah, most of the technology is in research. There's not a lot of off the shelf things that can necessarily be bought that are already well tailored. But things are becoming more and more available. So an example I like is the glasses with captions. I believe that they are fairly easy to make with the captioning piece superimposed over the top. So they're not fully available on the wider market yet, but apparently they will be soon. And there are also other possibilities looking at uh, the translation of research to practice and daily application. Uh, we're wondering if those resources might be um, available. Or is there a website anywhere that somebody could look or could you supply those resources about the kinds of technology that's out there? Sure, I have several publications on accessible technology and some of those publications are for tailored for the technical or technology professionals versus a more lay audience. But uh, I can certainly give you my website address and um, make a list of educator-friendly resources. So things that can be acted upon now. So things that you don't have to wait for. But I, I, I would want you to recognize I do work with two quite different audiences. So the, techs, the tech audience that a lot of my research is geared toward is not necessarily the same as the audience for today's uh, discussion, but I will make something available. So on AICT, aict.gallaudet.edu is where you can get to that. Great. One of our members said, I'm teaching in Ohio with students who are deaf um, in an oral setting. Uh, part of our program is inclusion with a general educator. I'm constantly seeking ways 
to best accommodate the children and provide access. When you mentioned visual noise, I instantly thought of the inclusion time at my school and how I might do a good job within the classroom. But I'm not always successful in terms of supporting them. Anything I should consider. Sure. I mean, I think information is power and empowering students through this process is important. So have examples ready and think about their perspective. Think about the school's perspective in terms of getting the best resources. I guess for things like videos, uh, when you post those, post the web page and use that kind of thing for support. Again, this is just a reminder, you're certainly welcome to enter questions as you'd like in the Q&A module. Are there publications related to this information? Uh, will this PowerPoint be shared, for example, and the links so that teachers and administrators can use this research to advocate for their deaf students? Yes, definitely. And I will post that on the web page, certainly. Are there any captioning systems that allow the creator to adjust how long the captions stay on the screen? Automatically, no, but there are some manual ways to do that. And there are several YouTube videos that you can look at for that. Oh, I'm blanking on the name. I think it's Magpie. You know what? I will have to check to confirm that I have the right address for that. Uh, but YouTube is probably the best. Everything is on YouTube, honestly. Wonderful. Uh, for eye gaze, maximizing learning and retention, should teachers allow time with prepared notes for students to copy during the lesson being taught? Or should this would we give students those prepared notes after a class is taught? I would say before class, set up that expectation so the student knows what to expect and then use the class time for explanations. It's a difference between a deaf class and a hearing class though. Typically uh, you'd want to show first, explain second, but oftentimes they will explain first and then show second and it really makes it hard for deaf students to uh, envision what's being discussed. So my recommendation is give everyone the material ahead of time for everyone's benefit. And these days with uh, electronic classrooms and electronic resources, it's also very easy to post that kind of information and do it in a, in a private way. Thank you. The next question, questioner asks about deaf people with cochlear implants who are working and listening to content but also have access to an interpreter using ASL. Would you recommend that the interpreter try to match the oral channel by signing an English word order? So signed language presented in an English format looks quite different. So if the oral channel is the primary channel for a deaf person, then seeing that represented in visual English might be best for that particular person so they're not missing information. But there is a well-known issue when we look at captionings that there is some delay so that asynchronous aspect becomes really uh, frustrating for the cognitive channel to rec try to reconcile what a person's hearing with a delayed rendition of what that looks like in text. So that's a very well-known issue. So when it comes to signing and speech, I'm not that familiar with what signs in visual English would look like to a person who's using their oral channel, but I imagine they're using the oral channel as the primary and the signs are providing support to words or phrases that might otherwise be misunderstood. As I said, I'm not the expert, but that would be my intuitive response and that's what I see the limitation would be. And that's another avenue for interpreters to advocate for themselves and let interpreters know how best to work with them. 
Moving on to the next question. You mentioned that deaf and hard of hearing viewers do not have as much access to the non-speech information or the meta-speech information. The question is how might that impact language development in the lower elementary grades? And how can the deaf students fully access the curriculum and social information in a classroom if there's no interpreter present? Yes, this goes back to the point of language deprivation versus language access. And again, uh, that's not really the scope of my particular field of research, but it's certainly an identified issue when we look at how people miss information and how to provide effective support. You know, honestly, I, I think I just have to say it's not my area of expertise before I continue trying to respond to that one. Fair enough. You talked about the need for maximizing the time on slides, such as writing the, the instructions or displaying the instructions. What if students are not fully able to access the English? How can we support those students? One well-known approach uses basic simplified direct English. So it's not using convoluted English construction. And in a sense, it's universal access that can be instantly understood by anyone with cognitive disabilities, with misunderstandings, with all manner of uh, neurodiversity. So when we look at this and look at it in terms of technology, we can think about translating complicated text to more simplified text that more accurately uh, is personalized to that particular student. And that tailored approach can be very helpful. There's more 10 to 15 years worth of research around in that field now. So when you look at web pages, you can uh, put in a request for that to be brought back in plain English, and you can do the same kinds of thing in an educational environment. You may have a complex text, transcribe it to simple English and make it much more consumable and uh, user friendly. And then again, you want to make sure that that language use is used for both information conveying and for communication. Thank you. Is it possible that uh, photographic reading or viewing is happening? Is it tied to photographic memory in some way? Uh, for very fluent readers who are in that environment on a daily basis, certainly could be. Again, there's not a lot of students I see with that. If they are growing up focusing on learning and trying to learn access to both languages or different modalities. I think that's a challenge that they are probably not at yet. But certainly there are some people when they are very fluent readers who could be doing what's called photographic reading. Sure. I just don't think that applies to most people. Okay. There's a question about cued speech. The questioner wonders if cued speech can be an option for students to access the curriculum. Might that minimize the use of eye gaze or caption demands? One of your slides talked about the speech versus captions and signs. But if you have visual speech, i.e. cued speech, might that support the captions more? It's possible. It's possible that cued speech might be less distracting or less uh, demanding on the visual field. But again, my sense is the delay may make it a little complicated. If it was really simultaneous, it might be different, but if, because it's always ever so slightly delayed, it can be somewhat frustrating for deaf students to uh, access language that way. And it's visual access to English, so it's not an independent language. We're in a, so in a sense, it would be like looking at captions. That's how I would equate it. Understood. You explained oral visual communication as linear, but blended communication as being all over the place with students accessing so much. What is easier for students to access? 
what I was saying before is that communication is two is bi-directional and comes and is bimodal. So it can come in via the oral channel or the visual channel. If it's coming in as text, it's typically word by word and people listening will use that the incoming oral input to augment the captions. But when you're looking at one channel or looking at uh, dialogue, then you want to, you, you would hope to have all of that coming in through one channel. But if you have a teacher who signs, that's a direct way of doing this, or the teacher has, we saw the example earlier, with the captions across the teacher's channel, that might be a way to do it. Um, if we have it all coming in the oral channel for deaf people who perhaps use cochlear implants, that might be an option. But it's hard to have all of the information coming in on a visual channel. So what you want most is to have that be done in a more efficient manner. And therefore a blended approach might be appropriate. Okay. So we are living in a time of COVID-19 and we have online distance learning. Would you encourage teachers to make more signed videos or more captioned videos? Or? Well, I'd say both. Remember the diversity with which our student population presents and consider their preferences. Uh, so like in an emergency video, not everyone's going to read the text. They may not be fluent readers, and therefore you'd want to provide a sign language, but signed version of that emergency information as well. So full access to me would recognize the individual student learning process, the individual students, and be as comprehensive as possible. Would that include cued speech? If the, if that student was a cued speech user, certainly. Right, it depends on the audience. Um, should teachers have interactions via Zoom? So look, with COVID-19 and all its implications, we've all turned into a virtual world. That said, so far, Zoom is the most deaf-friendly platform and is uh, leading at the moment with other platforms trying to catch up, but it's not perfect yet. So Zoom fatigue is a real thing. Hearing people are now complaining about it, about having to use their eyes all day long in these meetings. So if, you can if hearing people are finally complaining, you can imagine the Zoom fatigue on deaf uh, participants with their eye exhaustion. So we have to do some modifications here to become much more uh, viewer friendly. So when we look at having interpreters, they should be pinned so you're not searching for them. We need to make sure that deaf people have true access in Zoom meetings and that those protocols are followed. So feedback is, should be given to the organisers, etc. So that the product itself can be used at its most optimum. I mean, Zoom is quite popular for instruction. Are there other programs that you've had success with? Um, Google Hangouts, for example, or other 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 platforms that you might recommend yeah google google med is one of them there's uh the grid view that i like on that it's got automatic caption ability which is nice and a couple of other features but honestly zoom is still currently the best at gallaudet we are developing some products for captioning to be input into each video frame so that you can identify who the speaker is automatically and yet, and also to keep the order of people on your screen the same so that when you point at someone, everyone has the same reference point from their particular screens as well for where that person is. Currently, none of that exists. So you know, I may point to the left, but that person's actually on the right for somebody else's view. So we're trying to convince, uh, build the business case to convince users of the benefits of this. And deaf people are really pushing for this, looking for the company to make some changes. Oh, sorry, go and ahead. Also, sorry, I was also going to say Microsoft Team is pretty good, uh, but it doesn't yet have the grid view that we like, so not at this point. <laughs>
yeah, it's really important to have a clear picture. Zoom just seems to be fairly clear where it's sort of, you know, some of the other platforms are just not as clear, it seems like. I just wondered if there were other programs you've had success with. Is there anything else that you feel our audience should know about the work that you're currently doing? Uh, just to feel free to reach out to me. We've got resources for schools. Um, we can look, help look at policy. We're happy to share the results of our work with you. And the goal is to make a difference in the educational system. So please do feel, re feel free to reach out. Do you have any closing remarks that you would like to make before we wrap up today's session? Just to say thank you to all of you. I appreciate this Q&A that we've just had makes me think more about the work I'm doing and how it addresses your particular circumstances with my research. And again, if you uh, have questions or concerns as time goes on, please feel free to reach out to me. Well, thank you so much. Just as a reminder that there will be a student panel at 4 p.m. Eastern time zone. So hopefully the audience should have that link already. We want to thank you so much for being uh, involved in the first virtual NDEC conference. Thank you to all, and I look forward to seeing you and watching some of the sponsors' ads right now.